and we are live. So good evening, everyone. My name is Claire. I'm the event coordinator for Village Books in Bellingham and Linden, Washington. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this special event that I've been looking forward, for, to, forward to for a long time. We scheduled this way back. <laughs> and so finally, finally, we are getting to, to have this event. I wish it was in person, but we are doing the next best thing, right? So a few things about Crowdcast. Um, if you look in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a little button that says follow. If you click on that, then you can um, see, get updates and see all of our events that we have coming down the road. We have a lot of things happening. We are not slowing down um, the robust event programming that you're used to from Village Books. So I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, we are going to keep the chat enabled on the right side of the screen. So we encourage you throughout the, um, throughout the event tonight, if you have any comments or any feedback, or if you have any questions, uh, you can put that in the chat. You can also use the ask a question feature uh, at the bottom of the screen too. You can click on that, a little dialog box pops up. You can type in your, your question and we'll Keep, we'll collect them there until for when we get to the Q&A period. I want to remind you about the chat. Um, the Village Books Virtual Readings Gallery is a safe space. Any user exhibiting offensive, hateful, or inappropriate behavior will be dismissed from the event immediately. So let's see. Another important button on this screen is the one that is directly beneath me. It's green and it says purchase yellow bird here. If you click on that little button right there, it takes you directly to the Village Books website where you can purchase copies of tonight's featured book. Um, so if you are feeling inspired or intrigued um, and decide that you want to read the book tonight, which I hope you will because it's fabulous, just mm -hmm. click on that uh, click on that button and you'll be supporting the author and an independent bookstore and we would appreciate it. To any of you who did make a contribution at registration this evening, um, happily our event programming is all free, but we do appreciate those of you who maybe kicked in a few dollars at registration. Um, it does help us in these totally weird times to maintain the um, the programming that that you everyone has come to expect from us and love so um, so thank you so much for that if you didn't that's fine too like I say I'm glad that we can continue to provide free programming okay so and now to the good part so tonight I am pleased to introduce Sierra Crane Murdoch she is a journalist based in the American West and has written for the Atlantic the New Yorker online Virginia quarterly review Orion and High Country News. She is also a McDowell Fellow. She's here tonight to present her book, Yellowbird, Oil, Murder, and One Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country. And I am delighted because I have the privilege of being your moderator this evening. So <laughs> everyone join me in welcoming thunderous applause in your homes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sierra. Thanks so much for having me, Claire. I'm glad we could finally make this happen. I know. Oh <laughs> my gosh, I don't even I don't even remember what month it was supposed to be, like February or something. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have you. I'm glad that you could join us. So thank you. Um, so this book um, is so many things. It's so much more mm -hmm. than just a true crime story. Yeah. Um, so. I was hoping that just to, right off the bat, um, you would set it up for us a little bit. The setting is the Fort, uh, I hope I'm going to say this right, Fort Berthold or Fort Berthold Reservation? Ber Berthold. Berthold. Yeah. Okay, the yeah. Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. Um, and it's during the oil boom. Mm -hmm. And um, so can you just kind of paint a picture for the audience of, of what you saw there when you got there? Um, so what led you there and what were what were your impressions of everything that you were seeing there? Yeah, um, well, I actually started going to Fort Berthold in 2011. Um, I was, it was my first journalism job out of college. Uh, I was working for a little magazine in Colorado called High Country News. Um, and for my first cover assignment for the magazine, uh, an editor hired me to drive up to North Dakota where there was just this um, oil boom that was just beginning at that time, um, and to write a story about the tribal nation, the Mandan Haratsa Rikra Nation, that was 
right in the middle of this boom. Um, and so I went. Uh, I remember, initially I remember actually thinking, oh, is this what a boom looks like? <laughs> I, uh, prior to moving out to Colorado where the magazine was based, I had lived in Appalachia for a long time in Virginia and West Virginia. And so I was actually very familiar with boom and bust areas. I was familiar with coal town specifically. And, and I knew there actually, uh, because I had sort of begun my journalism career there and had written a few stories about the end of the coal boom. Um, I knew that that industry was very much transitioning. It was in sort of a post-industrial phase. Um, they were literally just like blowing up mountains and scraping off the last seams of coal because there wasn't coal to actually dig from underground anymore. Oh, and full disclosure, um, I'm a West Virginian born and oh, raised. Oh, you are? So, yeah, so I, I forgot to tell <laughs> you that one earlier because that was something yeah. I wanted to ask about. But yeah, so, so yeah, yeah um, when you when I when I read that you had come from mm -hmm. the Virginias out here, I thought, wow, I bet I bet she yeah. saw some 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 similarities. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, it was it was really interesting because I had seen the end of that boom bust cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And when I got to the Bakken, I thought, oh, this is what the beginning looks like. Yeah. And I actually thought, you know, maybe in 50 years, I'll come back here, you know, after I, I'll write this story, and then maybe in 50 years, I'll come back here and kind of see what it looked like after the fact. And of course, the oil boom in North Dakota ended much earlier than anyone right. anticipated. It was very quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I came back earlier and wrote this book instead, um, but uh, for obviously a number of other reasons as well. But um, at the time, just first arriving there, I think I was really surprised at actually how invisible the boom was, because what a boom really begins with um, a lot of people behind the scenes, you know, like knocking on doors and getting landowners to lease their land and um, basically very quietly uh, buying up the rights to minerals across a vast stretch of the landscape um, and, and trying to sort of consolidate those land holdings in such a way that they'll be able to reap the most profit um, once they begin drilling. So when I arrived on the Fort Berthold Reservation, most of the reservation had already been leased to oil companies and tribal landowners. I interviewed a lot of tribal landowners about their experiences not even really realizing that their, that their land was getting leased and <laughs> just, you know, signing papers or going to these auctions and realizing that, um, you know, their land was part of the, if their land had been sort of grouped together with other, um, with, with other pieces of land um, that the government was then uh, trying to auction off um, at bid prices that were actually remarkably low. Um, so that was my first story there. And then I just kept going back over the years um, and I became really interested in crime. Um, you know, there was a significant rise in crime uh, on the reservation and all over the Bakken region because just of the influx of people, um, you know, the strain on resources, but also on the reservation, it, the tribe had no criminal jurisdiction over non-native people who were coming there because of this major Supreme Court case um, called um, a, a major Supreme Court case from 1978 uh, that basically took away the tribe's power nationwide to um, criminally arrest and indict um, uh, people who are not members of that tribe. Um, and that had this profound effect on the reservation, you know, like I remember interviewing a number of police officers, tribal police officers, who said, yeah, it's just created this culture of impunity here. Um, and uh, one of the um, one of the really tragic consequences of that was that there was in particular a rise in violence against women um, and not just but the perpetrators were not just people who were coming there for the oil boom. Um, the per perpetrators were also in some cases, just people's own family members. You know, there was a lot of, st the boom brought a lot of stress. Um, it brought in a lot of drugs um, in part because there was so much money. Um, and, uh, you know, the people who were already struggling, you know, their struggles didn't improve by having that money. Their right, struggles that's, that was, yeah, that was, um, 
fascinating to me to to read about. You know, you, the, the you know massive amounts of money are suddenly mm -hmm. um, just falling onto you know yeah. this, this tribe and in in disproportionate ways. I mean, some people were getting tons right. of money, and then some people were getting nothing at all, and then. And it it created so many problems for the yeah. for the people to to have all this money land on them like that. Um, but then also to the crime, there's a there's a part early on in the book where you're talking about how, you know, if a if a white person committed a crime against mm -hmm. a native person, like the 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 native law enforcement couldn't intervene because a white person was involved in the white police couldn't intervene because a native person I mean right. it was mm -hmm. it's just this horrible catch-22 where you're right there's no there's no accountability um right it, th there's no 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 law law to fall back on um so it's just like it's it appears like just kind of a lawless yeah. situation and certainly, you know, those cases, you know, that involved, um, like, if there was a um, non-native and a native perpetrator involved in a crime, you know, that became the province of federal authorities. And also most significant crimes were already the province of federal authorities because of um, also another uh, act called the Major Crimes Act, which also in certain ways undermined um, uh, the sovereignty of tribes nationwide. So there, yeah, there were all these, there were all these mechanisms in place that made it really, just really hard for the tribe to police within its own boundaries and for the tribe to um, take control of the oil boom. You know, it really, it caught them by surprise um, in very uh, significant and in some cases damaging ways. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so let's get to the crime that's central yeah. to to this book, which is um, a a worker goes missing. A, he's a truck driver, right? Mm -hmm. For for a company called Blackstone. Yep. Um, his name is um, Christopher Clark. K Christopher with a K, so he's Casey. A mm -hmm. lot of people refer to him as Casey. Uh, he's a young man, and um, and he goes missing. Yep. He says he's going to go uh, visit his grandfather. He goes to the offices of Blackstone to turn in his credit card, and then he's never seen again. Mm -hmm. So, so what happens next mm -hmm. is just very strange because in steps this woman mm -hmm. who just takes up this case, like it makes it her obsession, really, right? To mm -hmm. find out what happened to Christopher Clark. And so yeah. please tell us about Lissa Yellowbird. Yeah, so I had heard actually about, I had heard about this case in 2014, um, but Casey had disappeared in 2012. And I went up again to Fort Berthold to investigate this case. And in the process of investigating and trying to write some sort of story out of this, um, I uh, came across Lissa Yellowbird, um, who, it, it was a relative of hers who introduced me to her. Um, and uh, the relative had basically said, oh, you're looking into that. If you are, then you really need to talk to Lissa. And I, at the time, just knew her as someone who had actually been searching for Casey Clark's body. Casey Clark still had not been discovered at that point. Um, and, uh, a lot of people have been looking for him, um, authorities have been looking for him, but the person who really had been looking for him for a very long time had been this woman, Lissa, and she was a member of the tribe. She actually didn't even live on the reservation at the time. She lived five hours away in Fargo. So she was just driving <laughs> like all through the night, you know, Friday after work, she worked as a welder at the time and she'd drive all the way out to the reservation and she'd camp or she'd stay with her relatives and then she'd drive all the way back on Sunday night and then go to work at 4 a.m. the next morning. Um, so yeah, you're right, it really was this obsession. Um, but when I actually met Lissa, um, that was when I realized that not only was she searching for Casey Clark, but she also had immersed herself very deeply in this case. Um, 
in ways that were very surprising to me. Uh, <laughs> um, and in order to kind of show me how deeply that she had immersed herself in this case, um, she invited me out to Fargo. So I flew out to Fargo and she would go to work during the day. Um, and I would, uh, I was sleeping on her floor at the time. She had a number of kids who were living with her still. And, um, and then she would just, when, after she left for work, she would just leave her computer open um, and she would just let me kind of sift through her hard drive and download all of her documents, uh, thousands upon thousands of pages of text messages and email conversations and um, Facebook messages. And, and not only that, but like audio recordings of phone calls she made with people or audio recordings of um, of scenes that eventually made it into my book um, when she was asking people questions or visiting people and just trying to dig up any information she could about Casey Clark's disappearance. Um, and what I found as I was reading through this correspondence was that she had um, in some cases like befriended <laughs> um, some of the people who she believed were really close to this crime and may have been involved or may have know something. Um, she had tried to get as close to them as possible. And um, I was just, of course, like completely fascinated and blown away by this. Yeah, um, she's, she's so, um, I mean, it, it's, uh, she's manipulative, but you know, she's <laughs> manipulative to, to get the information that she's, you know, she's trying to solve this mystery and she, she, does what she needs to do to try right. to get to the truth. She's exactly. tenacious. <laughs> yeah, she has a very clear sense of justice and she pursues that in ways that some of us might consider morally questionable. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, and, yeah, and she's, she's, but then to, so now we've, we've got kind of this idea of this woman who's obsessed with this case, but mm -hmm. what we need to share with people is so Lissa went to University of North Dakota, right? And she got mm -hmm. a degree in the criminal justice program there, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So she's, but then she also found herself in the criminal justice program as um, a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. and, and as in, she, she is a recovering uh, alcoholic and drug addict. Mm -hmm. um, she was a stripper. Um, she So she found herself on the wrong side of the, of the law and, mm -hmm. and did time. Um, and she has five kids, yeah. um, grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, her personal relationships are fraught. <laughs> <laughs> but mm -hmm. so she's, there is just so much to this person. Right. Um, yeah. I remember someone said she was insatiably curious about the world. And I think mm -hmm. one of her sons says um, she has nine lives that never end. Her daughter, yeah. yeah. Her daughter, her daughter My mom that. is like the cat with nine lives whose lives never run out. <laughs> right. Because she, you know, got hit mm -hmm. by a truck. She, right. But, so, um, so, yeah, I, I know that a question that everybody asks is, why was she so obsessed mm -hmm. with this particular case of a, of a white man going missing, right? Looking looking like perhaps killed by other white people, not from mm -hmm. the reservation. So, what do you have any insight mm -hmm. as to what it was about this particular why why Casey's case? Yeah, um, well, that is the question I begin the book with. <laughs> and it's a question I try to answer by the end. So I don't want to spoil too much okay. of that thought process for, <laughs> for readers. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, there are so many reasons. So I can speak to some of them without spoiling it. I mean, um, and I don't, I don't think there's one explanation, right? I think, you know, she has said, you know, in the beginning, she had emerged out of prison. Um, like you said, she was someone who had lived on both sides of the law. Um, she'd gone to prison for dealing drugs. Uh, she had been addicted to meth and to crack previously. Uh, she was in recovery. And she was looking for kind of a distraction, like a way to stay sober. Um, and, uh, you know, she was working full time by the 
time by the time that she began searching for Casey Clark. Um, but while she maybe was looking for distraction, she also is someone who is quite distractible. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I've learned um, that she she is someone who has uh, nurtured a lot of obsessions over the course of her life. This one just happens to have been one that um, was particular, like really overtook her life in a, in a very big way. At one point in the book, uh, her daughter, Shauna, who I also spent a lot of time with, says um, she was the one who had that comment about the cat with nine lives. But um, she also says, you know, she gets angry with her mother because her mom, because Lisa is so obsessed with this case. And, and she says, you know, it's, it's like you subbed one addiction for another. Um, and I think Lisa believed there was some truth to that as well. Um, that she is the one who, yeah, does have these, these obsessions that uh, can become addictions. And, um, and this happened to be one that was sort of for the greater good and one that helped her, helped her uh, stay healthy and helped her stay sober. Yeah. Um, so those are some reasons, but there are also, you know, there are deeper reasons. I mean, I think what becomes clear over the course of the book and what be, has become clear to me in the time that I've spent with Lissa is that she has this deep, deep well of radical empathy yes. <laughs> for, um, for people of all kinds, you know? And, and I think, um, you know, she now is someone who searches for uh, many missing people, not just um, Casey Clark. And she uh, really has begun to search quite a bit for missing and murdered indigenous people, um, men, women, and children. And um, this is a cause that she cares about deeply and it's become her life. She now is no longer a welder. She does this kind of work and she works in the recovery community full time. Um, and so, uh, you know, through this book, I was able to watch that transformation. And, um, you know, I think I have done, I, I worked on a, a podcast for This American Life this spring about Lissa's search for her niece um, who went missing. Um, and that, in many ways, it was a transition point for her and beginning to search more for indigenous people. Um, but this case still felt really important to me, even as she was beginning to enter that work that was getting a lot of traction nationwide. It, because, you know, this is, this is a subversion of the white savior narrative, you know, it's like this really incredibly brilliant, dynamic, fascinating, um, and complex woman uh, going in, you know, going going around law enforcement or pushing law enforcement. Um, in this case, involving um, mostly white people, <laughs> um, and so I think there was something satisfying too about that, um, just being outside the grain in terms of um, the narratives that we so long have um, have seen emerge from places like Indian country. Mm -hmm. I appreciated how um, how she she goes out searching, and it's it's um, and sometimes she involves family, sometimes she involves mm -hmm. her sons. And it's uh, it's it's spiritual. She's mm -hmm. when she's searching, she's not just like she is very. She's guided by her. I don't want to say gut or instinct mm -hmm. because it's because it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's it's. Mm -hmm. Uh, she she really listens to the spiritual world, um, mm -hmm. and and I th that was fascinating to me. Um, what was that like to watch and to be a part of, to, and to be around? Um, I mean, I, huh. Yeah, I mean, well, 100%, first of all, <laughs> yeah, that is entirely true. Um, her spirituality, I realized over my time with her, was going to be essential in this book. And honestly, that was um, a bit of a scary thing for me, particularly as a white writer, um, to have to learn to work with, because uh, I, I recognize that um, historically, um, 
there is a pattern of non-native writers sort of romanticizing or exoticizing um, indigenous spirituality or religions, um, and also sort of casting them in a, um, a sort of lump, lumping native spirituality under sort of one uh, pan-indigenous umbrella that isn't necessarily always um, a correct representation. Um, so I knew there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of mistakes I could make. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, but at the same time, I also recognized that it was something that I this was something I was going to have to work learn my way through. Um, and in order to do that, I did spend a lot of time with Lissa kind of in her spiritual circles. You know, I um, went to sweat with her, even though I don't write about that in the book. I, I wanted to understand these experiences for her and I wanted to understand that community and I wanted to be able to write about it accurately. Um, and I wanted to be able to write about it in a way that wasn't like anthropological, but just was sort of just like integrated into her daily movements. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I did that by just spending a lot of time in, in those spaces with her. But at the same time, too, I, I began to recognize that her spirituality, you know, was, um, it had a number of different influences. You know, it was influenced by more traditional Lakota culture. Um, she was uh, very involved in the Sundance community. Um, she went to sweat. There was this sweat lodge, like in this empty city lot south of Fargo, um, where people would go and gather. Just like it was so interesting, just like in the midst of these high rise apartment buildings. Yeah. <laughs> we don't just be praying down in there um, and then eat like sloppy joes in the little shack after words um and then uh you know but she also grew up catholic you know her family was extremely catholic um due to the missionary influence uh, that had arrived on the reservation in the 1800s um so you know there were there were a lot of influences to her spirituality um and she was kind of redefining it for herself also in her recovery um i loved <laughs> she she had a lot of thoughts on sort of the way spirits occupy the living world and and the way they move and how they can like pass between objects and mm -hmm. um you know she'd be like yeah you know there's like maybe there's a spirit in this hot dog maybe you know and so i, I wrote about that you know i i wrote about um her spirituality being something that was uh, very personal to her you know it wasn't i wasn't necessarily writing about it um, in any sort of way that would represent, you know, her Arikara tribe's um, right. sort of spiritual beliefs, but something that was very specific to her. Well, mm -hmm. and so um, how did she, um, how did she introduce you when you were, um, when you were having, ex do, when you were doing things like that with her, like going to the sweat or, um, or even just when you were searching, when you were out in the community, um, were you received in the community or how what 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 did people perceive as kind of your who who were you you know yeah well i was always the person who was writing this book about her <laughs> um i had you know i had my recorder running i had not not when we were in sweat you know like that was that was off limits i wasn't sure. going to be writing about sure. those experiences specifically i was just going to experience them along with her um but, you know, when we were just sort of going on a search together, we were visiting relatives with her, we were um, driving across the reservation and um, going to events on the reservation. Um, yeah, I, I was just, I was just kind of along for the ride. And, and she would, in the beginning, she just introduced me as, yeah, this is Sierra. She's writing, writing this book. Um, and uh, of course, you know, as time went on, people began to know me pretty well. Um, yeah. I got to know her relatives very well. And so, um, you know, I would just kind of show up in their house and we'd hang out. Uh, yeah, um, this was a years long. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how many years did, did was this was this process? With Lissa, um, about five years. Yeah. So, yeah. I and imagine they got to know you pretty well. They did, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I I think that was this was a project that Lissa obviously um, 
believed in after a little while. You know, it took, I think, a year of us really getting to know each other um, for her to get to the point where she knew that I was going to, that I was along for the ride for a long time. And, um, and she felt invested in that herself. Um, but other members of her family, I, I, you know, I felt a little bit uncomfortable about the fact that they didn't have that same level of consent in this project. You know, they, okay. they certainly, um, you know, Lisa was the one who introduced me to them and said, here's Sierra, she's writing this book about me. You better talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> and not, you know, not everyone talked to me, um, but most of them did and, um, and incredibly grateful to them for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, eventually they became very, very used to me <laughs> coming around. <laughs> well, um, so I kind of want to pivot now to, um, to uh, a, a different topic the the writing the I I want to gush a little bit about your writing oh, I, you. I really like your writing style um, yeah. and um, so before I read the book I came across coincidentally um, there was an excerpt of it in Harper's right yeah mm -hmm. and it wasn't it the the piece on Uncle Chucky it is I, yeah okay so. Yeah. So I read this piece before I had even read the the book. Before we had, I knew that you were gonna gonna be coming to Bell, <laughs> coming, coming to Bellingham. Yeah. Um. So I had I had read this piece and it really struck me. And then as I was just reading the book recently, I came across that piece again, and it's one of my favorite parts of the whole book. So Lissa had mm -hmm. a favorite uncle Chucky, who was, mm -hmm. um an extremely intelligent man, uh, also mm. a very curious and inquiring mind, right? Like, um, yeah. but he also had his own demons, um, mm. namely uh, pretty severe alcoholism and mm. then depression too, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Um, so um, there's a part in the book where Lissa is reminiscing about her uncle Chucky's death and mm -hmm. because they were very close they like to they like to talk about all kinds of different things you know yeah. um so the night before he died she talked to him he called her on the mm -hmm. phone and it was very clear that he was not okay mm -hmm. um but so i was hoping that you would read a, yeah. um, an excerpt from the book about about what they talked about because it's it's a really interesting and, and powerful piece. Sure, yeah, I'm glad to. Yes. She often thought of what her uncle had said to her that night. He had said a lot of things, but one thing he kept coming back to. He had been reading about human DNA, about the way our family histories are imprinted on our nucleotides. He said that our bodies remember. Some scientists believed that our genes could be turned on or off by the things our ancestors had seen or done or the things we ourselves had seen or done. So it was possible that our fates were decided by former lives and that our lives in turn decided the fates of our grandchildren. Imagine that, Chucky had said, no such thing as innocence at birth. Violence, like milk, passed from grandmother to mother to son. Imagine that. Imagine how impossible it is to stop something like that. Hmm. So I was, I'm, I'm fascinated by that idea that, mm -hmm. that, that trauma can just be, and experiences can just be passed down generation to generation in the DNA. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And is, do you think that that's a, a, a common belief? um among mm -hmm. among people particularly people who have experienced you know generational trauma or tra trauma as a, as a people yeah yeah I, I mean yes certainly i would say that you know i've spent much of the past 10 years reporting a lot in indigenous communities um and this uh, idea of trauma being passed from generation to generation is something that people talk about all the time. Um, it actually was a concept that was uh, popularized um, by 
a Lakota woman, um, a sociologist, and I'm, I think her name was uh, Mary Braveheart. I would have to look that up again. It's it's toward the end of my book, um, but she. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds familiar. That sounds yeah. Right. She popularized this concept of um, inherited historical grief um, that, you know, there were layers of trauma um, within tribal communities across the country, really within indigenous communities across um, North America um, that, you know, really began with um, periods of genocide, with disease, um, with being forced onto reservations um, and not having access to hunting grounds or gathering grounds, not having access to the kind of um, self-sustaining lifestyles tribes that had previously, um, to them boarding schools, to children being separated from their parents, um, to uh, then in the case of this reservation um, and actually many reservations along the Missouri River um, there were a series of dams that were built and uh, that flooded out a majority of each of these tribes, uh, most, um, most productive farmland where many of their villages were. And so these tribes, including the uh, men and Hadatsarik nation were then forced to relocate onto higher ground, um, rebuild everything from scratch. Um, and through that, uh, became much more dependent on federal assistance, which is highly unpredictable. Um, so, yeah, this idea of of sort of layered trauma um, is something again that that is talked about frequently within Native communities. Um, it's something I, you know, it's a conversation I had frequently with with all kinds of people in my reporting, um, whether they were sociologists or advocates or <laughs> whether they were just, you know, people who just like to read about this kind of thing. Um, you know, Lissa's family is incredibly well-read and they read all the, <laughs> all the major uh, um, indigenous historians and, and psychologists. Right, her parents, her parents are professors, right? Um, her mom, yeah, was a long time professor of social work and um, her uh, uncle who she calls dad is one of the preeminent sociologists when it comes to um, decolonization theory. Mm -hmm. um, neuro decolonization is a concept he writes about and talks about a lot. Um, so yeah, these were ideas that were kind of floating around her family quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, the idea of epigenetics that um, our DNA can change from generation to generation is actually a pretty widely accepted and, and widely studied science at this point. Um, and yeah, it, you know, I put it into more poetic terms in, in those paragraphs, but um, Chucky was reading articles about, uh, he was reading scientific studies that were emerging um, from this field of epigenetics about the way that um, our genes can be altered um, in certain ways. The scientific term would be gene methylation, um, but altered and then, and then expressed. Um, and then those expressions could then be passed on through our DNA and that you actually have to kind of like actively <laughs> um, alter your lifestyle um, in order to counteract, you know, those effects in our DNA. Um, so yeah, the it's not just sort of a theory that um, Lissa's family was tossing around. It's something that Chucky was, you know, reading about and, and studying. Um, and so he would call, he would call her and they would have these conversations about inherited trauma and, um, and he talked about it that again the night before he died, and and that, you know, as a journalist, I I always try to be very careful about taking frames and and imposing them on on the stories I'm writing, right? Because you want to create space for stories to surprise you and to turn out differently from what how you expected. Um, mm -hmm. But it became very clear in all the time that I spent with Lissa and her family, and particularly in this story about Chucky, um, who I knew pretty early on in my process that he would become a really essential part of this book. Um, I, you know, I, I knew because of that, that inherited trauma um, was going to have to become, you know, a big part of this story. Mm -hmm. 
and and not yeah. just the trauma itself, but like how do you heal from that, right? The co it's uh, this is a story. It, it, there's a lot of trauma in this book. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of really dark scenes, um, and but there's also a lot of healing. And and so that was my question: is like how do you how do you heal from that? And and Chucky, you know, in that scene there, it's he's not really able to heal from it, right? But Liz is wondering, like, okay, how how do you do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's also a whole lot of, of beauty. There's humor. There's humor yeah. in the book too. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, but there's so much beauty too. I, I there are points where you know they're out searching for a body. They're searching mm -hmm. for a missing person. But but there are still moments where they stop and they just look around and 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 remark on how beautiful the land is or the or the spot is where oh this would be the really perfect place to bury the body look how beautiful it is i mean um yeah. it was it was really incredible when when you were talking about the flooding of the of the river and the um displacing of the communities i just i couldn't help but think of uh the mountaintop removal and the mm. flooding of the hollers in west virginia yeah. and the communities that were down down in those hollows that had to that have had to just completely relocate because right. everything just gets flooded and washed away and it's um yeah ah, the things yeah the, oh the humanity <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really interesting. You brought that up because one of the last stories I actually tried to do but never wrote um, when I was living down in southwestern Virginia was about just a major flood, you know, that had washed off this um, stripped mountainside and just completely wiped out a community. Um, yeah, you're right. Yep, it mm -hmm. happens. It happens. Um, so you did share some photos with me. Would now be yeah. a good time to to show. Sure. To share yeah. those? Okay, mm -hmm. let's see. This is going to take me a second. Okay. <laughs> <No problem. laughs> um, but you shared some really uh, beautiful images that I was hoping you could talk us through. Yeah, I just, um, you had said, you know, as you were reading the book, you're like, wish, I wish I could really see some of these places. And so I thought I'd pull together just a very short collection. Um, this is a view of Lake Sakakawea, which is the reservoir that was created um, when the Missouri River was dammed on the reservation. And so uh, the tr Lissa has a really interesting relationship um, to this. I think, you know, for her grandmother's generation, her grandmother was born underneath that water you know, um, you can kind of actually look straight out and from this photograph, and that's where Elbow Woods was, um, the one of the main original villages um, before the reservation was flooded um, in 1953. So, um, so yeah, her grandmother uh, was a, was alive. Actually, her mother was alive at that point. She was just a really small kid, um, and so you know, I think a lot of elders look at the lake with some with bitterness and mm -hmm. with nostalgia and with anger still. Um, I think a lot of people more from Lissa's generation, you know, she explained to me, we kind of love the lake in a lot of ways because it's this sort of natural, semi-natural beauty that we grew up with. You know, she grew up fishing on the lake. She grew up swimming in the lake. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is beautiful. Yeah, she grew up gathering, uh, you know, gathering herbs from along the lake and these, um, these lilies here are one of her grandma's favorite plants. And so um, I snapped this photo because it, it made me think of that. She, she'll go out sometimes and, and dig up lilies for her grandma to replant um, on their property. Nice. nice. Yeah. And what's this? This is uh, in the book, um, you know, Lissa is constantly just like driving from one end of the reservation to the other. And this is the bridge over Lake Sakakawea. And you can sort of see on the left side of the bridge, um, that's Four Bears. That's where um, the tribal government um, is based, and where actually that's the village where um, Casey was living at the time that he disappeared. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like this one. Yeah, this is actually from a Sundance um, on the reservation uh, before the Sundance. This is in the days leading up to one. Um, and I just, uh, 
<laughs> just remember being so um just a just really surprised at being out there and and how like quiet and peaceful it really was but then you look on the horizon and it's just this diamond glow of of drilling rigs and of flares um the uh, the orangey color is um is a flare off in the distance and all the um sort of whiter lights are um are drilling rigs that are being uh new wells that are being drilled okay mm -hmm. There she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned there's, you know, they'd stop and say, um, you know, wow, look how beautiful this spot is. And this was a spot that Lissa loved um, in one of the areas where we, I went searching with her frequently um, for Casey Clark. And this was one of the places where we would go. Um, and she had actually just come out here with her son, Obi, who I also feature prominently in the book. And he, they, have a, a difficult relationship through much of the book and and then um he does end up coming with her on a search and um she describes him coming out they both mm, sort of interviewed separately with me about about this uh search but she described him um just kind of getting a sense for what she's been doing out there and and uh, realizing just how beautiful this place was and and she described him sort of tumbling down this little hill and then ending up in a little uh, grove of um of trees and then opening up and looking out over and seeing this unbelievable view down into the clay canyons and so this was that spot um and uh so i had oh, a, i had listened to and he yelled up to her something about like mom it's so beautiful here yeah. or something like that. Yeah. yeah yeah i love that <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is this close this is, by again or? yeah close by same same area so this is kind of the landscape that Lisa and i were walking through and and you mentioned earlier you know that yeah, there was a lot of beauty in the book and, and a lot of humor and you're right i mean these searches i originally i thought oh gosh like tromping through the badlands after Alyssa searching for um you know someone who has died and potentially even been murdered i was like gosh it sounds really scary and um i spent a lot of time outdoors so that part wasn't uh scary to me but but just the sort of concept of of searching for a body um was very foreign to me and but as we would you know move through this landscape Lisa was just constantly noticing things and showing me things and showing me animal signs and showing me different ways in which the land um you know reacted to rain and reacted to snow and reacted to all different kinds of changes and um and then also yeah she's just hilarious she's really funny and so you know she's constantly cracking jokes and, and oh i think um, this next picture then there yeah <laughs> maybe maybe get maybe a, a, glimpse, a glimpse of that yeah exactly that's why i included this because she just she really makes me laugh but um this was from three weeks ago actually oh really um, yeah i drove across the country to visit my parents uh, and as i was driving back um i stopped in north dakota and listen i hung out on her porch uh, she's moved back to the reservation actually uh, since i wrote the book and and uh she now helps take care of her grandma her mom's living on the reservation too so the three of them pal around together quite a bit and uh but lissa now lives across a wheat field from her grandma's house and here she was um pretending to spy on her mom and oh. grandma from across the wheat field <laughs> so every now and then as we were talking she'd like pick up her binoculars and just, or she, she'd see their like car like drive out the long driveway out toward town and then drive back and she'd just like watch them <laughs> It's funny. Uh, well, yeah. thank you for sharing those with us. Yeah. Um, so I guess, let's see, now would be, we've got a few minutes left. If anybody out there in the audience has any questions that you want to ask Sierra, please, now is the time. You can put them in the chat or you can put them in, ask a question. Um, but in the meantime, um, I want to know uh, what you're working on currently. Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> I finished two big projects uh, this year. I did a uh, episode for This American Life, which was actually 
related to the book, it was about Lissa's search, um, as I mentioned earlier, for her niece um, who went missing in 2016. And her niece is um, Chucky's daughter. Um, and so this was a story that was really, um, really emotional. It was a story that Lissa hadn't spoken about for quite some time. I knew what had unfolded right when it unfolded because Lisa and I were in constant contact. Um, but then we just really didn't speak about it for a long time afterward, which is very unusual for her because she's always talking about her cases. But I knew that this one had affected her in a way that no other case had. Yeah. So um, we did an episode. Uh, she and I worked on that with the producers at This American Life. And um, so if you can listen to that, it's called A Mess to Be Reckoned With. Um, what is it called? A Mess to Be Reckoned With. A Mess to Be Reckoned With. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting it in the chat. Great, yeah. And uh, I just wrote another piece for Harper is actually about um, climate uh, refugees from the island of Saipan in the North Pacific. Um, oh, wow. And that came out this month. And now I'm, I've honestly been taking a little bit of a break. <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you're, you're sub, the things that you write about are not easy things by right. any means. Mm -hmm. um, and I would think that they would, um, they would, they would take a lot out of you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To me. Um, yeah. This, this book was a long process and it, uh, it, I mean, we, we yeah. didn't even really touch on the, the mystery aspect of it. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, there's a whole, it's, it's really, I feel like a few books inside one book. Mm -hmm. um, Cause there's just the, the whole, you know what happened to to Casey mm -hmm. um, question, and all of the right. people who were involved in that. Um, and I highly recommend mm -hmm. that everybody run out to Village Books and buy the book <laughs> and read it. Because, <laughs> yeah, because, support your independent bookstores, please. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is a compelling read, um, mm -hmm. and, and for for someone who probably reads. I would say that I probably read 85% fiction. Oh, wow. I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, mm -hmm. this breeds like, like a really great mystery. Um, Thank you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for you um, and Lissa for sharing, for sharing the story. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like Lissa could, there could be a whole book just right. about like Lissa needs to write her memoir <laughs> <laughs> or you, you write her memoir. right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Every time she comes up with more stuff, I'm like, Lissa, you just, you're, you're the next one's on you. <laughs> That's funny. Um, she um, has every now and then joked about writing a, um, a how to book for how to turn your criminality into good. <laughs> Which you know makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, and yeah. yes, I mean yeah. that's that. I I bet you it would be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Well, unless I mean we don't have very much time left. Unless nobody has any questions, I think. Unless there's mm -hmm. anything else that you want to to share about the book or about anything else before we go. I'm no, so grateful for you yeah. for coming tonight. This has been wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for making this happen and asking such great questions. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I, I could have asked a whole lot more, but I also <laughs> realized that we don't want to tell the audience everything. Right. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. And yeah. um, I guess we will. Oh, Anna says thank you. And then I guess we had people from the from the Bay Area, Myrna mm -hmm. and Leon from from San Francisco. I don't know if you know them, but uh, I anyway, mm -hmm. people from from the Bay Area. That's cool. So that's really cool. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. This has been really fun. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. And with right. that, I will say over and out. Okay. Take care. Okay.